Today we will be discussing Jacques Derrida's The Animal That Therefore I Am Following, which was originally a speech Derrida gave to a conference in 1997. The topic of the conference was the autobiographical animal, and so Derrida's focus is to examine the way we establish differences between ourselves, humans, and that which we call the animal, the very concept of which Derrida calls into question. To start with, let's watch a short commercial. As you watch this commercial, you should be thinking about what is this commercial about, what is its message, and how does it convey that message? Clearly, this is a commercial about orange juice. The message that it is naturellement pulpeuse means that it is naturally pulpy, but also naturally fleshy. A play on the carnal images were shown. Some other background information here. The commercial reminds us that there is a subculture called furry fandom, where for some furs or fans, anthropomorphized animals make them furry. That is, anthropomorphized animals is a fetish. The commercial also displays examples of furry denial and furry reminders. Furry denial occurs when an animal is unaware that it is an animal or that it is an animal of a particular species. When the panda is shocked and embarrassed because her clothes are ripped off, she is in furry denial. She forgets that as an animal, nakedness is not something to be embarrassed about. A furry reminder occurs when we are reminded of an animal's animalness. When the camera pans from beneath the deer in a sexual angle that focuses on the deer's bottom and then the deer twitches her furry tail, we are reminded that, yes, indeed, this is an animal. In some ways, this commercial may be trying to simply make a statement about or take advantage of the sexually overt commercials from other brands and countries, but here, because the sexual objects are animal, many viewers have found the commercial disturbing. So let's ask, why exactly is this commercial disturbing? Let's include the fact that probably several of you laughed at the commercial as well. The point is, the commercial was likely shocking the first time you saw it, or would likely be shocking to your friends and family if you watched it all together at the theater or in the living room. That is, we don't expect to have our senses assaulted by sexually anthropomorphized animals. But once again, why not? This is a question Derrida helps us to answer. So, Derrida, who is he? Derrida is a prominent figure in philosophy. He is a French philosopher of the late 20th century, best known for fathering the critical theory of deconstructionism. Deconstructionism approaches texts with the belief that language is unstable. And though Derrida insists on page 402 that he will not dwell in this argument on deconstructive points, as we might expect him to, we still see him play with words in what can only be described as true to the characteristics of a deconstructionist. At one point when discussing his cat, for instance, he digresses and shifts focus to Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, where a cat is also mentioned. And seemingly out of nowhere, he says, quote, 
Although time prevents it, I would of course have liked to inscribe my whole talk within a reading of Lewis Carroll. In fact, you can't be certain that I'm not doing that, for better or for worse, silently, unconsciously, or without your knowing. You can't be certain that I didn't already do it one day when ten years ago I let speak or let pass a little hedgehog, a suckling hedgehog, perhaps before the question, what is poetry? For thinking concerning the animal, if there is such a thing, derives from poetry. There you have a hypothesis. It is what philosophy has, essentially, had to deprive itself of, etc. And he goes on from there. Of course, although he is playful and makes us doubt his true meaning, he has a point in the end. In this case, he ends the passage by focusing on the hedgehogs that form the croquette balls, and the hedgehog turns around to face Alice. Derrida's point at this cheeky moment is how can an animal look you in the face? It's a playful question to be sure, but it has some serious answers. Let's start then by asking, what is he being playful about? And for this, let's go back to the beginning. In the beginning of the address, Derrida says that he will focus on nakedness. He says, quote, To begin with, I would like to entrust myself to words that were possible would be naked. Naked in the first place, but this is in order to announce already that I plan to speak endlessly of nudity and of the nude in philosophy. Starting from Genesis, I would like to choose words that are, to begin with, naked. Quite simply, words from the heart. Here he means to present nakedness as a kind of metaphor for naked words, naked truth, that is, language and thought without artifice. He seeks to reveal the nakedness of animals and humans. He references Genesis as well, as he frequently will, and he does this to inform us that he means to call into question the prehistory, or a priori knowledge, that humans use to conceptualize the animal as other. That is, in part, he argues that it is a long-standing history that fuels our misconceptions of the animal, and that this history goes back to what he philosophically calls the beginning of time, the moment of humankind's fall from the Garden of Eden. The point being, it is simply a part of our anthropocentric Western history to see animals as other. But obviously Derrida doesn't believe animals are truly or wholly other, and that is why his address, this article, is titled the way it is, quote, the animal that therefore I am following. The title gives us further insight into Derrida's focus. In the original French, the title phrase I am and the parenthetical title phrase I am following sound the same in French when properly conjugated to the present tense. Both say je suis. And in this punny way, Derrida alerts us to the idea that though we often think of the animal as other, human identity actually rests upon following the animal or animal nature. That is, whereas our Western preconceptions see the animal as following us and humans taking the lead in evolution, progress, propriety, and so forth, Derrida suggests that humans may in fact be also behind, subordinate, subject to, and so forth to the animal. It is important to note here that Derrida's goal is not to create a binary relationship between humans and animals. He does not want to say we or the animals are masters or slaves to each other. What he's trying to do is call into question this idea of binaries at all. Hence, in the title, he doesn't just say I am, as in I am the master, but I am following simultaneously and contradictorily. It is at this point in the presentation that Derrida introduces his cat, which is a passage that might help lend some further clarity to the points in his introduction about nakedness and preconceptions. On page 372, Derrida writes, quote, I often ask myself just to see who I am, and who I am following at the moment when caught naked and silenced by the gaze of an animal, for example the eyes of a cat, I have trouble, yes, a bad time overcoming my embarrassment. Whence this malaise? I have trouble repressing a reflex dictated by immodesty, trouble keeping silent within me a protest against the indecency, against the impropriety that comes of finding oneself naked, one's sex exposed, stark naked before a cat that looks at you without moving just to see. The impropriety, mal séance, of a certain animal nude before the other animal, from that point on, one might call it a kind of animal séance, the single incomparable an original experience of the impropriety that would come from appearing in truth naked in front of the insistent gaze of the animal, a benevolent or pitiless gaze, surprised or cognizant, the gaze of a seer, visionary or extra-lucid blind person. It is as if I were ashamed, therefore, naked in front of this cat, but also ashamed for being ashamed, a reflected shame, the mirror of a shame ashamed of itself, a shame that is at the same time specular, unjustifiable, and unable to be admitted to, 
at the optical center of this reflection would appear this thing, and in my eyes, the focus of this incomparable experience, that is called nudity, and about which it is believed that it is proper to man, that is to say, foreign to animals, naked as they are, or so it is thought, without the slightest inkling of being so. Ashamed of what, and naked before whom. In this passage, in short, Derrida stands naked in front of his cat and feels embarrassed. More than this, he is astonished that an animal has successfully made him feel shame, not for being naked per se, but for being ashamed. Derrida is, as he says, ashamed of being ashamed, and he is ashamed of being ashamed because he recognizes that he should not be ashamed in the first place. That is, in the first place, he is ashamed of being an animal, that is, naked. And he is ashamed of being ashamed because humans are animals and should not be ashamed for being so. That is, his nakedness stands in for a truth revealed about the human body that humans, at least Western humans, usually try to hide, that we are animals. The animal then, once again, like an, quote, extra lucid blind person, as he says, sees not our nakedness, but who we really are, again, animals. And finally, the cat reminds Derrida that it is improper to be naked, and that it is ridiculous to feel that one is improper when naked. Derrida connects this feeling of embarrassment about his impropriety with the concept of animal séance. He coins this term, animal séance, by mixing the French word for impropriety, mal séance, and the French word for animal, Thus Derrida calls this nakedness animal séance, as if to say being animal and being improper are one and the same, again, at least, to the Western mind. Let's bring this back to the commercial where the scenarios are comparable. Instead of an animal staring at a naked human, as it is with Derrida, we viewers are, with the Orangina commercials, humans staring at naked animals and yet still feeling disturbed by it. As mentioned earlier, the commercial is shocking. Many of the original viewers felt embarrassed when watching the commercial, and it caused much controversy upon its debut. But if we associate impropriety with animals, why are we so shocked by the commercial? The animals in the commercial are, after all, just being animals, improper and wild. What makes that so disturbing? Now, normally when animals are represented in commercials, they are idealized. And remember that idealization doesn't always mean that the idealized subject is a better version of its real form. Instead, think of idealization as simply going beyond reality, which could be in a positive or negative sense. A common example of idealization is the idealization of women, where the ideal woman may not just be the virginal, chaste, motherly, or domestic figure, but the whore or the bitch. Idealization takes real subjects and then abstracts them into ideas that cannot exist in reality, because reality is usually more complex and messy. The idealized animal typically appears in a few ways. For one, the ideal animal is often conceived as not being like humans in any way. For instance, we might not expect animals to have sex for pleasure. This seems to be a particularly human activity to us, a luxury afforded to humans, while animals must have sex in order to survive. We often also think of animals as either innocent and cuddly, like pets, or brutal and violent in a naturalist sort of way. In this commercial, we see each of these aforementioned idealizations, and not only do we see each of them, but we see them blurred together. Their boundaries dissolve, we'll say, with the rush of liquid orange juice to create an amalgamation, something new, and something in between these traditional ideals. For instance, the anthropomorphic animals take pleasure in sexualized activities. In this way, they are neither quite human nor quite animal. In the same manner, the animals are presented as both innocent and brutal. The deer and the bear come together in a furry denial of their differences, no longer prey and predator. Innocent and experienced, the deer and bear are both hunter and hunted, teaser and teased. The ideals mentioned above, non-human, innocent, and brutal, are present throughout, but they are mixed in this commercial, and it is in part this incongruity that many find disturbing. It is the blending of the improper animal with the proper animal that causes many viewers to be embarrassed, and it questions the very concept of an animal being improper, that is, of animal séance, which is precisely what Derrida wishes to do. At the end of the passage about Derrida's cat, Derrida asks, Ashamed of what, and naked before whom? Let's take this one question at a time. Why am I ashamed? That's one question. We've already identified with the commercial that we are ashamed because the animals begin to act like humans. 
They cross the boundaries that we imagine help separate humans from non-humans, and they violate our expectations of propriety or proper behavior. Derrida adds to this that in one sense his violent reaction to hide his nakedness, to bite his tongue as if holding back something that is forbidden, is an animal reaction, biting his tongue in a brute and physical response, and an unthinking, idiotic, asinine reaction to a problem that should be faced with intelligence and rationality. We are made in some sense animal by our embarrassment and reflex to hide that embarrassment. But it is only the human who is embarrassed by its nakedness. Derrida writes, quote, From that point on, naked without knowing it, animals would not, in truth, be naked. They wouldn't be naked because they are naked. In principle, from the exception of man, no animal has ever thought to dress itself. Clothing would be proper to man, one of the properties of man. Dressing oneself would be inseparable from all the other forms of what is proper to man, even if one talks about it less than speech or reason, the logos, history, laughing, mourning, burial, the gift, and so on. The animal, therefore, is not naked because it is naked. It doesn't feel its own nudity. There is no nudity in nature. There is only the sentiment, the affect, the conscious or unconscious experience of existing in nakedness. Because it is naked, without existing in nakedness, the animal neither feels nor sees itself naked. And it therefore is not naked, at least that is what is thought. For man it would be the opposite, and clothing derives from technics. We would therefore have to think shame and technicity together as the same subject, and evil in history and work and so many other things that go along with it. Man would be the only one to have invented a garment to cover his sex. He would only be a man to the extent that he was able to be naked, that is to say, to be ashamed, to know himself to be ashamed, because he is no longer naked. And knowing himself would mean knowing himself to be ashamed. On the other hand, because the animal is naked without consciousness of being naked, modesty would remain as foreign to it as would immodesty, as would the knowledge of self that is involved in that. So, in other words, animals are nude without being nude because nudity doesn't exist in nature. Thus, this idea of nudity takes on the essence of not just truth and shame, but shamelessness, which is, in the context of our Genesis myth, a form of ignorance in human terms. Nakedness is truth and shamelessness, as well as shame and ignorance. For the animal, nakedness is shameless, and so it exists in a state of non-nudity. Meanwhile, humans that are nude are never nude because they are ashamed and thus constantly hiding or clothing, at least in their minds, who or what they truly are, thus never truly being naked. They exist in a state of nudity, that is, the consciousness of nudity. All this brings us to an odd junction with the Orangina commercial. If animals are nude without being nude, and humans that are nude are never nude, are we, as the embarrassed viewers of the commercial, like animals that no longer have a sense of nudity, that exist in a state of non-nudity, or like humans who retain the sense of nudity, exist in a state of nudity? More simply put, in our embarrassment, when we are mentally unclothed and our animalness is revealed, are we non-nude or nude? This is a question Derrida poses us, and certainly there is no clear answer. But what Derrida does give us is a history of the ways we have mistreated this question and the subject of this question. That is, we have now come back to the second query from our passage on the cat, ashamed of what and naked before whom. We have addressed the first question, what are we ashamed of, which is in some circular and nebulous sense, our animality. The second question we have yet to answer, that is, naked before whom, or as Derrida suggests in his title, who am I following? The who is the animal, but the question is, who is the animal? In one sense, the animal is, as we've been saying, a messy concept. It is who we are and are not simultaneously and in contradiction of each other. But history has painted the animal as other, and that's what Derrida wishes to expose. Referring back to his example about the cat, he points out that part of the reason why we are disturbed by the cat's gaze is because the gaze is aggressive. We've come upon this term as well with Virginia Woolf's flush. The gaze of an animal is active. You cannot escape it. You cannot stop it. It simply happens, and you are helpless to prevent it. This is the same intrusive gaze that unsettles us when a stranger stares at us from across the street, in the bar, or in class. 
The gaze is a dominant gesture, and it makes us the inferior to some other superior subject. It makes us the object of that subject's focus. So Derrida's cat's gaze is disturbing because it reverses the usual relationship we think of as existing between human and animal, master and slave, to use those terms of othering. In the Orangina commercial, it is the same. The animals ruthlessly gaze upon each other, and such sexualized, aggressive gazing is unsettling to the typical human viewer. Derrida also takes to task the many disciplines that purport to speak for or protect the animal without ever really taking the moment to be seen, or seen seen, as Derrida says it, by an animal. That is, a biologist, zoologist, environmentalist, and so forth, they all address animals, look at them, study them, but Derrida explains they never consider themselves as being looked at themselves. They have seen without being seen, reinforcing this concept that the animal is yet and still other. Naming is another way we have othered the animal. For this, Derrida returns to his narrative of Genesis, the story of man naming the animals, even though he himself was not created until after the animals were created, following, as Derrida's title says, after the animal. Once a thing is given a name, though, it deprives the thing of the chance to give itself a name. When we name a thing, we ignore its ability to name itself. The result of this process of naming is that man creates in himself a sense of sovereignty and loneliness, power, and division. Once again, the point is, much of our history has misrepresented the animal, and we have misrepresented ourselves. There are a few more examples of this that are important to note. In defining the animal, there have been several historical landmarks. One is Jeremy Bentham's defense of animal rights by asking not whether the animal is useful, but whether the animal can suffer. In response, Derrida scoffs and replies that of course animals can suffer, and asking that question only opens the door to doubt about whether or not they can suffer, the repercussions of which we are still seeing today as scientists seek to measure how different animals experience pain. The second historical definition Derrida addresses is the one that distinguishes animals by the fact that they cannot communicate. And by communicate, these proponents mean that animals cannot lie. They may react or respond, but they cannot cover their tracks or hide behind words the way humans do. This is where the argument stood in Derrida's day. And so Derrida then responds asking, what are we to do then? Should we speak for the animal? But he's already established his views on that. The biologist, zoologist, and environmentalist see without being seen seen, he says. The danger of pitying an animal and assuming that we must protect it means we are still othering the animal, seeing it as inferior, and us as benevolent protectors or stewards. So should we do nothing, say nothing? But again, Derrida has already pointed out how biting one's tongue is an act of stupidity rather than rationality. Should we simply proceed as we always have and continue to allow the exploitation of the animal by ignoring these misrepresentations, perhaps even participate in the naming of animals that results in their othering as farm animal, beast of burden, pet experiment, and so forth? The answer to this seems obvious, that is obviously not. So then what are we left with? How can we connect with the animal without othering it? Derrida's response is that change must happen not in actions, though eventually change should occur there, but in thought. We act in the ways we do because we think a certain way about the animal. For instance, the idea that the animal needs to speak, to name itself, to defend itself, to respond to us, is entirely anthropocentric. The cat, for instance, doesn't need to speak, not in our words. It is we who require it to speak, to respond to us and answer our questions. We must change our way of thinking. To begin with, Derrida offers one change, that we stop referring to animals as the animal. The very idea that we've grouped so many different kinds of animals into one chimerical heading, the animal, invites misunderstanding. Instead, we must recognize the multiplicities of our relationships with animalness and animals. To do this, Derrida offers offers a neologism, animal. This word is a combination of the French word for animal, animal, and the French word for words, mot. When put together, animal, this becomes a homophone for the French plural form of animal, which is once again, animal. Derrida claims that this new word can remind us that animals are many and varied. Moreover, it doesn't try to escape the fact that we can't escape ourselves. In the passage on the cat, Derrida points out that the cat is a mirror reflection of ourselves. We deplore our anthropocentrism to some extent, but we cannot escape the fact that our knowledge and perspectives are based in the human experience, which is largely dependent upon language. So while it is true that language and naming has created grievous misunderstandings in the past, 
language must also be a part of the steps we take in understanding animo. Thus, animo connects the animal with human language and words. Finally, the idea of animo is fanciful. It does not claim to give animal speech because, as we mentioned earlier, animals don't need the power of speech. Instead, it combines the human and non-human in a way that isn't typically combined. And with this, Derrida asks for a kind of suspension of disbelief to break us away from our preconceptions, to not see the human and non-human as a binary divide, but as something messier and more immersive, and to reconsider the ideas of and ways of thinking about animals. Thus, in the end, to answer Derrida's question about who we are following, he answers, we are following ourselves.